and welcome to Contextual History. This is the first episode of a three-part series on the last imperial dynasty to rule China, the Qing. Each week we'll be looking at a general overview of the history of the dynasty, charting the course of its rise and fall. Along the way we'll be looking at some of its unique aspects, its strengths, and the structural weaknesses that ultimately contributed to its collapse. Hopefully, along with gaining a broad understanding of the dynasty that greatly shaped modern China, you can gain some insights into the lives of the people that lived through it. Before we continue, a short word on Chinese naming conventions. Chinese dynasties are not typically named after their ruling family, as in Europe. They take in a name that describes the state in some way, often in moral character. The Qing's name refers to purity, and references water and coolness, in contrast to their predecessors, the Ming, which means bright, you know, implying heat and sunlight. Upon ascending to the throne, emperors would surrender their birth names, thereafter only being referred to by their titles. Their reign would have its own descriptive title, and once they died, they would be given a temple name to refer to them in death. In addition, reign names could change at the emperor's decree to reflect changing times. The origins of the Qing dynasty begin before the 17th century, with the people that would become known as the Manchu. At this time, they lived in the sedentary or semi-nomadic communities in the thick forests and flatlands of Northeast Asia. This is an enormous area, covering the modern Chinese provinces of Heilongjiang, Jinan, Liaoning, parts of Inner Mongolia, and the Russian Far East. These people had long existed at the periphery of both the Chinese and Central Asian worlds, and had long histories of both conflict and peaceful coexistence. The Jurchens, one of these people, would conquer the northern part of China and rule as the Jin dynasty in the 12th century, and would later be conquered and incorporated into Genghis Khan's Mongol Empire. Come the late 1500s, the Jurchen and surrounding groups were united under the rulership of a Jurchen nobleman, Nehasi. His son, Hong Taiji, would rename their united peoples the Manchu, and their state the Great Qing, in 1636. It would be these Manchu the edge of the Sinaitic world that would lay the foundation for the final dynasty that would rule China. The rivals to Nehasi's descendants, the Ming dynasty, had ruled China for nearly three centuries. They had come to power in the collapse of the Mongol Yuan dynasty during the 14th century. Outside of China, the Ming dynasty is perhaps most famous for sponsoring the voyages of Zhonghe, whose enormous treasure fleets travelled as far as the East African coast. These sitting Ming emperors possessed greater wealth, resources, and subjects than a confederation of northern tribesmen could ever hope to muster. Just how was it the Qing were able to topple their foes and conquer the Middle Kingdom? Of great importance was the manner that Nehasi forcefully reorganised Manchu society. Every Manchu household was integrated into a new system of military and social organisation, the famed Eight Banners. Members of the Banners gained military service to the Qing, each banner had a clear system of command, and bannermen received stipends from their rulers. The banners themselves, differentiated by colour and pattern, served as the symbols of the individual social and military units, and were under the direct protection of the banner commanders. Structurally, they developed out of church and hunting traditions. Banners of different colours were traditionally used by hunting groups to signal and communicate on the large-scale hunting that took place on horseback in the northeast. The organisation of these hunting parties, as well as their terminology, were easily turned to the purpose of war, and laid the foundation for the Manchu military, but also their social life in the centuries to come. The banner system also demonstrates another advantage of the Ming, their ability to integrate outsiders into their service. While the original system was only for Manchu, as the early Qing were brought in other groups into their rule, parallel banner systems were set up. Many Mongol clans were closely involved with their more sedentary Manchu neighbours, and were brought under Qing control through methods of military alliance and military subjugation. So close were the Mongol elites bound with the Manchu ones, that it's more accurate to describe the early Qing state as a bi-ethnic one, rather than a Manchu one with Mongol allies. In addition, many Han Chinese lived along the northern frontier, semi-integrated into Manchu life as farmers, herders, or traders. Other Han who joined the Qing were deserters, as commanders of the Ming, or rebel armies in the south saw opportunity in joining a rising power in the north. Along with the eight Manchu banners, an equal number of Mongol and Han banners were eventually established. These Han brought experience and knowledge in using firearms and artillery from China, which the Qing were not apprehensive in exploiting their conquests. 
In addition to these, a third reason for Manchu power is a little less violent, though in my opinion, a lot more interesting. It's fundamentally economic, that the Qing were able to support their great enterprise, in large part by the sale of ginseng to consumers in China. Prior to the explosion of industrial manufacturing in Europe and North America in the 19th century, China was the single most dominant economic entity in the world. While it had entered something of a crisis by the 17th century, this still held true in the age of Nahasi. Now, it was a common phenomenon for Chinese dynasties to restrict trade with outside entities. China, after all, was the centre of the world. Whatever foreign barbarians could offer, what could it possibly compare to the wonders of the Middle Kingdom? This, combined with Confucian distaste for merchants, who were viewed as parasites who created nothing of value other than leeching off the works of others, meant that despite China's enormous economic power, foreign trade was not a sphere of particular popularity for Ming scholar officials. This did not mean that it didn't happen at all, but rather that it either took place under highly systematized and controlled means, or under the official radar. Chinese porcelains, tea and silk were valuable goods from Osaka to London, in exchange for foreign gold and silver. In addition, China's neighbours had goods other than precious metal that were desirable for Chinese consumers. These include gemstones and exotic timber from Myanmar, spices and medicinal ingredients from the island chains of Southeast Asia, and of course, furs, pearls, and ginseng from the north. The ginseng trade was a particularly lucrative one. Ginseng is a slow-growing perennial plant long sought after in China for its fleshy roots, an important ingredient in traditional medicine associated with health and longevity. It typically grows in cold climates, such as the northern homelands of the Manchu. Domestic sources in China, centred around several mountain ranges in Shanxi, were being stretched to exhaustion. By the late 16th century, a great deal of silver was making its way north to Jurchen chieftains, who were granted licences by the Ming for the import of the route. At times, the outflow of silver could reach as high as a quarter of the total silver import into China. Nahasi, the founder of the Qing state, grew his empire in the back of this trade by waging wars with other license holders until he possessed a virtual monopoly on the trade of ginseng with the Ming. This windfall of silver was of great use to the early Qing. It paid for firearms and heavy artillery, and for gifts and bribes to Mongol and Jurchen chieftains. It also likely contributed to the defection of Ming forces, who were paid generous salaries for switching sides to the Manchu. So, am I really suggesting that ginseng was what allowed the Qing to conquer China? Certainly not a zone, but it is an important fact to consider. To the south, the Ming had more trouble than just an overconsumption of ginseng. A global reduction of temperatures, the so-called Little Ice Age of the 17th century, led to the shortening of growing seasons for China's agricultural base. Ecologically, deforestation in northern China meant that floods were becoming increasingly common and destructive along China's great river systems. These factors put much of the enormous class of rural peasantry under great hardship. Now, this might not have been as devastating had the government been in a healthy state, but a string of child emperors and the increasing power of eunuchs in the imperial court had enormously increased the distance between the central government and local bureaucracies. Important national projects, such as the huge system of dikes, levees and dams for flood control, fell into disrepair as funds and direction for their maintenance fell away. Lack of oversight and inconsistent payment of officials' wages encouraged the growth of corruption. More globally, the predation of British and Dutch privateers on Spanish and Portuguese shipping decreased the import of silver into China, leading to an increasing dearth of precious metals in the economy. As taxes had been paid in silver, peasants faced further hardship as their own decreased output was devalued in the face of the shortage. Unsurprisingly, famines became common and the people increasingly desperate. Desperate people are often compelled into desperate actions. In the face of economic destitution, famine and an imperial government unwilling and unable to step in, disaffected groups and unpaid soldiers revolted in many areas of the empire, fleeing the sinking ship Many officials and military leaders either joined the rampaging rebel armies or fled into the service of the Qing. By the late 1640s, the situation in northern China had coalesced into two distinct rebel factions, feuding between themselves and Ming loyalists over land and followers. In 1644, the more powerful rebel leader, Li Zicheng, launched an offensive and managed to seize the imperial capital at Beijing by having the gates opened by treachery. 
Seeing the loss of his capital and the desertion of his servants, the final emperor of the Ming dynasty committed suicide by hanging himself from a tree in the imperial garden overlooking the Forbidden City. Now looking at the situation, you might be forgiven for believing that Li Jitong would go on to proclaim himself emperor and found a dynasty that would rule China. However, events on the northern frontier would prove Li's downfall. After the consolidation of power among the Manchus and Mongols by the beginning of the 17th century, the Qing would increasingly press into Ming territories in the northeast. Many battles were forced over the course of the next three decades, but distracted by troubles at home and facing an increasingly organised and powerful foe, the Ming were forced to cede much of their northeastern territory to the Qing. Ming fortresses became frontier outposts of the Qing, while cities such as Xianyan and Dalin were either occupied or sacked and burnt to the ground. Such is war. The true moment of opportunity came, however, after the conquest of Beijing by Li Jicheng's armies. The largest forces still loyal to the Ming was the army of Wu Sangui, stationed at the Shanghai Pass, east of Beijing. Shanghai Pass is located where the range of hills that carry the Great Wall of China curves around to meet the waters of the Bohai Sea. It's therefore an important location to defend against armies from the northeast and inner Asia looking to enter into China proper. Wu was faced by something of a dilemma. His emperor was dead, and he was caught between the rebel armies of Li Jicheng and the Manchu, Mongol, and Han armies of the Qing. Li Jicheng bade Wu to join with him, rather than being crushed by his armies. Wu, however, decided to refuse him, and wrote to the Qing regent Dorgan, inviting the Qing to enter and help put down the rebel forces. Now this was an offer Dorgan could not refuse. The banner army swept south, receiving the surrender of Wu's armies at Shanghai Pass. Together, they smashed Li's forces in battle near the pass, forcing the rebels to flee south and abandon Beijing. This allowed the Qing forces to enter the imperial capital unopposed, where their now deceased Hong Taiji's six-year-old son was proclaimed the Shunji Emperor. From the perspective of the Qing, this was an ideal situation. They had been quite literally invited into China, and the previous emperor had been kind enough to dispose of himself. As far as they were concerned, they had merely entered to restore the proper moral order of society and to put down the rebels that had plagued the countryside, thus restoring the prosperity of China. Now, this heavy-handed propaganda is important when considering the situation the Qing were in. Though they now controlled Beijing, they were far from the undisputed masters of the empire. The task of bringing the rest of China under their control would be a Herculean one. Even once it was subjugated, actually ruling China without the cooperation of the local people would be impossible. The Manchu and their allies were dwarfed by the population they found themselves the masters of. Accordingly, the Qing attempted to retain as much of the previous structures of government as possible. The enormous imperial bureaucracy that ran the empire under the Han were retained, while the interests of the traditional Confucian literati would be protected, so long as they supported the new dynasty. Despite this, the Qing had a vested interest in not fully assimilating into the Han world they sought to rule. In their own view, to do so would represent abandoning the martial ethics that had let them prevail over the Chinese at all. Even before the conquest of Beijing, Manchu elites were concerned at the behaviour of their countrymen, who settled in frontier cities like Xinyan and adopted Chinese habits. Features of Manchu culture, such as archery, horse riding, and the Manchu language, were held to possess a particular moral character, and thus needed to be maintained against the threat of wholesale assimilation. To do otherwise would lead to a loss of prestige and legitimacy, ultimately threatening the safety of the regime. Thus, while they would rule as Chinese emperors in the vein of previous dynasties, the new emperors would make sure to let everyone know that the nation was under new management. This was impressed in a very physical manner. Their subjects would bear their allegiance to the empire upon their bodies in the form of the queue. The queue is a hairstyle you might be familiar with from 19th century depictions of Chinese men. It involves shaving the hair at the front of the head whilst plaiting the hair at the back into a long single braid. This was a traditional hairstyle of Jurchen men. The Qing required bannermen and surrendered soldiers to adopt as a symbol of submission. It would not be long after the conquest of Beijing that it became required for all male subjects, excluding Buddhist monks and Taoist priests. The implications of such requirements are quite extensive. 
hair, you see, often has powerful ritual significance in human societies. As a mandatory symbol of loyalty and submission, refusal to conform signaled treasonous intent to the Qing. Effectively, it served as a wedge to drive out those who might resist the new empire into the open, where they could be dealt with as a lesson to others. Correspondingly, the conquest of China was not a particularly peaceful one. Along with subjugating the remaining factions of Ming loyalists in the south, Chinese subjects who refused to adopt the Ku were summarily executed as traitors. This quandary can be summed up by the popular phrase of the time, keep your hair and lose your head, or lose your hair and keep your head. To modern observers, this might not seem a particularly difficult choice, particularly if demanded by a heavily armed horse-riding warrior. However, in Ming China, Confucian understandings of filial piety, the moral duty one had towards one's parents, ascribed hair a sacred position. As a part of the body, and thus a gift from one's parents, hair should be cared and maintained by careful grooming, and cutting it should certainly be avoided. To the Ming, long hair displayed masculinity and elegance, which these northern barbarians sought to remove from their Han subjects. As you might expect, the imposition of such demands turned hairstyle into a rallying cry for the Qing's enemies, for those who saw themselves the final guardians of legitimate imperial dynasty. The forces of the Ming loyalists displayed their resistance to the banner armies by flaunting their uncut hair, an open defiance to the commands of the Qing. However, bold symbolism would only get enemies of the Qing so far, as by the late 1640s, banner armies would sweep south and defeat the forces of the Ming Prince of Fu at Nanjing and the Prince of Gui at Chaojing. By 1650, most resistance from Ming loyalists had been crushed, and the Ming imperial claimants killed or driven into exile. Despite their victories, the Qing were greatly overstretched in their conquests of the enormity of China. They simply did not possess the resources and manpower to fully control the entire empire. In the north, the banners were organised into a series of garrisons in subjugated towns and cities. Here, they acted as a parallel system of imperial authority, keeping an eye over both the civilian population and the local bureaucracy and militia. In the newly subjugated south, however, control of higher provinces were handed to three defected Ming generals, who ruled these enormous areas as nearly independent realms. This arrangement of power sharing would prove to be rather unstable, when, in 1673, Wu Sangui, the general who had first invited the Qing into the Inner Empire, revolted against the new dynasty. He was soon joined by two other generals in proclaiming a Zhou dynasty, demanding the Qing withdraw beyond Shanghai Pass. Despite the irony of the situation, the three feudatories, as they are sometimes known as, presented a real threat to the young imperial state. The rebellious generals had enough time to set up strong, viable regimes in the more prosperous south, while the Qing were still unstable in the war-ravaged north. However, a number of factors allowed the Qing to come out on top. The feudatories were unable to communicate and efficiently press their advantage on their foe, avoiding any decisive move. By contrast, a new emperor, the young Kangxi, was able to rally Qing supporters around crushing the revolt led by a new generation of young Manchu generals eager to win a position of note, imperial forces spearheaded an advance south to defeat their former collaborators. The defeat of the three feud trees represents the last real threat to the early Qing dynasty. While other conflicts would certainly happen during Kangxi's reign, notably with a Taiwanese pirate law and Russian settlers, these did not threaten the existence of the newly established empire. The empire would be allowed to settle down and establish roots in administrating China. However, despite ending the threats of the previous dynasty, the fundamentally tenuous nature of the Qing's grip on China would be a constantly looming shadow. Their legacy as outsiders from the northern frontier, and the violence of the conquest, would be something the empire would never really escape. This would really colour the course of the dynasty in the centuries to come. This is going to end our introduction to the birth of the Qing. And I hope you join me next week as we jump forward in time to what is commonly seen as the golden age of the Qing dynasty, the reign of the Chenglong Emperor, where we will see the emperor at its height, but also the seeds of the coming disaster. Until then, have a nice week.